the centerpiece of this was, of course, the big power competition between US and China. And we all know about it. It's an ideational struggle. It's an ideological struggle. And look at some of the ideational struggles. I mean, the Chinese say that um, you like your freedoms. Congratulations. We like our public order. When a clown moves into a palace, he doesn't become king. The palace becomes a circus. So you need talent at every point. Happy Independence Day, Jai Hin, Namaste, and a very warm welcome to A Questioning Mind. I have with me today Lieutenant General Raj Shukla, who has been General Officer Commanding in Chief of Our Track, the Army Training Command, who is very well regarded with all things military and defense. Uh, an honor to have you. Happy Independence Day and a very warm welcome. Thanks a lot, Sagarika. Happy Independence Day to you, your viewers. You. And I think it's a good day to begin this. Uh, podcast and this acquaintance with you and your viewers. So thank you so much for getting me on your show. Thanks a lot. Of course, uh, my pleasure. And it's uh, it is quite an auspicious uh, start. And I'd especially like to thank you since it's a small channel. We've just crossed 2000 subscribers. So thank you so much for joining. Uh, all the best you. May you grow, may you grow ever thank so you. fast. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, so the geopolitical situation across the world is extremely volatile right now. A lot has changed and has changed very rapidly. How do you see the overall geopolitical situation? And as we go on, you know, I'll uh, come down to specific geos, uh, such as the Indian subcontinent and uh, the West Asian regions as well. So, you know, there's so much uh, happening in, in the world today. Uh, I think it was Winston Churchill who said that for decades, uh, nothing happens and in, the, and in weeks, decades happen. So I wonder whether that's a good metaphor to begin. Right. Because I really think uh, we are in the midst of uh, two major geopolitical swivels and everybody has his own take on it. Uh, I see it in two ways. One is I see the international order transforming mm -hmm. greatly. And there is a definite challenge being mounted to American hegemony. In fact, I think American hegemony is over. Its supremacy may still uh, be retained. We'll speak about that. And it, uh, maybe because I'm from a military background, I see a major civil from um, the economy to national security. So we, uh, I'll try and flesh these two arguments out and see if you think uh, they have substance. So, you know, I have written a piece on in the India Foundation, a very detailed piece on this uh, intensifying contest between um, what I say is a crumbling old order. It's not yet gone, but it's mm -hmm. still uh, got a lot of energy in it, but it is a crumbling old order. And this rivalrous new axis, uh, which is quick, you know, China, Russia, Iran, yeah. North Korea. North Korea. It, it does sound, uh, you know, uh, harmless. It seems harmless, but when you go into the depths of what it is doing, they are really not only asking for a seat at the table, but they are wanting a new table mm. to be designed for themselves. And their strategic coordination in challenging American primacy, its military power, its economic might, and the dollar, they seem to me very significant. So, you know, uh, let me just uh, elaborate on this a little bit. If you see what's happening, uh, the centerpiece of this was, of course, the big power competition between US and China. And we all know about it. It's an ideational struggle. It's an ideological struggle. And look at some of the ideational struggles. I mean, the Chinese say that um, you like your freedoms. Congratulations. We like our public order. Right. You may not agree with it, but they say that. Uh, your freedoms are fine. We like public order. Look at the way they are challenging the whole capitalism thing. They say that, uh, you know, uh, your politicians are captive to capitalism. We are not. We encourage innovation and enterprise. When, but when the time comes or when the need so arises, uh, see what we did with Jack Ma. This whole uh, takedown of big tech. Now, I'm just giving you the Chinese perspective. Neither do I agree with it, nor will many in this country agree with it. So this is the ideational uh, contest. It is also, you know, I think there is a Niblet, Robert Niblet, I think he's British and he 
observes the international scene very well. He makes this point you know, that the Cold War, this is Cold War 2.0. And he says that, uh, you know, uh, the US and Russia are reversing into the Cold War. They are so tightly knit, but the competition is pushing them into the Cold War. They don't want to. So you talk of de-risking, decoupling. It's also not easy. You know, when the balloon was brought down, uh, he made a comment. The balloon was brought down by the F-22 Raptor, the American fighter. But if you open the F-22 Raptor, 50% of the microelectronics are Chinese. So how do you, uh, you know, de-risk? So it's a pretty uh, complicated issue. Also, given the current uh, scene, China, the way it is economically integrated with the world, it benefits from stability. It wants stability. Russia, on the other hand, other hand, is uh, benefits from instability, or it is benefiting from instability. It was the instability of the Middle East which got it back into the Middle East once right. Singer had eased them out. In Europe, uh, they are regaining, uh, shall we say, salience because of what they've done in Ukraine. So there are these complications. Uh, there are many, you know, agreements, disagreements. Neil Ferguson says that Ukraine is the first hot war of Cold War 2.0. He equates it to the Korean conflict. And there are many parallels, uh, you know, the mm. many interesting parallels. But what I find most, uh, you know, important is the strategic coordination across theaters. You know, look at Russia, China, don't talk of any alliances like the Americans. They've gone on about alliances. So they say we don't want alliances because they are, you know, treaty obligations. So they talk of things like, um, um, what is that, uh, friendship without limits. Now you keep wondering what it means. But in the text of that speech, friendship without limits, there is a categorical call for international relations of a new type, a multipolar system that the USA no longer dominates. Mm -hmm. This is uh, there. If you see a year later, 22nd March 2023, Z and Putin meet at the Kremlin. And uh, he made this remark, uh, Z, you know, let's come together because this is a time we are seeing changes not seen for 100 years. Right. Now, anybody who doesn't understand the deeper Chinese take on all this, the way they talk through these proverbs and these these so-called cliched sayings, um, if you read Rush, Do Rush Doshi's book, The Long Game, he points out that in 1872, there was a Chinese general called Li Hong Zhang. Mm -hmm. And he said then, you know, he pointed out to the American, uh, to the uh, to his uh, the Chinese monarchy then, that we are seeing 3,000 changes not seen in 3,000 years. He was pointing to the possibility of Japanese predations, uh, technological changes taking place. And historians in China are of the view that because the Chinese ruling class didn't pick this warning, they got into their century of humiliation. So the tragedy was because they didn't see these changes. Now see how Z is smartly repackaging it or repurposing it. He's saying that was a tragedy. This is a time for opportunity. Changes not seen in 1000 years. Let's come together and drive the changes together. And also do what? They have been talking of American decline for a long time. And they are now sensing the moment, even blood, and saying, let's come together and let's hasten the uh, USA's fall and see now what they have done. America spends $950 billion. It has 800 bases, 11 aircraft carriers. That is the foundation of America's power. Look at how they have, in 2010, Obama talks of the pivot to the Pacific. Thereafter, they get trapped in Europe. They're now getting ensnared in West Asia. So do they fight in four theaters or they win in one? And today their debt is $35 trillion, which means their debt servicing is $1 trillion, more than the defense budget. They do not have the military bandwidth to expand. So what happens to the pivot of to China? This could not have happened without strategic coordination. Look what the Chinese supplied to the Russians in Ukraine. The Anthony, I mean, I think the West is a little innocent in this regard. Democracies are innocent because they work in this very cool, calculated, ruthless manner. And, you know, uh, North Korea, could you imagine the one country which bailed out the Russians in when they were in trouble over ammunition was North Korea. Mm. North Korea of all. 
Iranians gave the Russians drones, a country under sanctions. And these drones were used in Ukraine to, you know, the data of Ukraine to improve them. And they were used in 14th of April in West Asia. Now, is this all by coincidence? Then it was remarkable coincidence. So I think there is some, uh, you know, coordination behind this. Look at also, I just make two more points. From 2018 to 2022, Russia supplied 83% of Chinese arms imports, uh, air defense, anti-ship, submarine capabilities. And what is the political outcome? The political outcome of that is the A2AD system that the Chinese have conjured up is threatening American hegemony in the Western Pacific. 1995, China acts smart over Taiwan. Bill Clinton sends two aircraft carriers. China backs off. It smells the coffee. Today, Admiral Paparo is saying we can't send aircraft carriers. They'll get sunk. Look at the whole change in the power balance. You know, and so I can, uh, and I'll just make two more points about this. And now they're looking towards the global south. 125 mm. countries, 80% of global population, 40% of global GDP. This is the new Karambhumi. And the instrument of delivery is BRICS. Five members, now 10, 49 waiting to come in. Mm. So this is a challenge to the, you know, West-led order. And not that the, you know, uh, and what are they talking of? Look at this. This is also important. They say we want an order of nodes that engage, not poles that are in perpetual contest. An order that reflects the globe's diverse cultures and civilization, not a monochromatic Western view of the world. Putin and St. Petersburg said we must have an alternate system of payments. I mean, what is this? If we disagree with you, you take us out of this system, that system. So there is a massive pushback, de-dollarization. Uh, this whole bit about oil. And one last point, is the West out? Certainly not. American uh, contribution to global GDP in 1918 was 25% of the global GDP. It still is. The seven biggest tech companies are still American. We know that. Uh, it still has the largest military. It may be a grand initiator and a poor finisher of conflict, but it is the largest military technologically enabled. And look at this, the liberal Western order, USA, Europe, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, I'm quoting Farid Zakaria, still contributes 65% of the global GDP, 75% of global military spending, 95% of global ideation agenda setting, you and so on and so forth. So I think we are, the contest is going to be severe, it's not done, but we are headed for what some people call the greatest show on earth. Uh, Mr. Jay Shankar, over the last week or so, has been saying we are in the five most difficult years. Mm -hmm. He's talking of re-engineering all our relationships. So in the context of strategic autonomy, I understand all the benefits that come from strategic autonomy, freedom of choice, and so on and so forth. But we really need to uh, take a fresh look at our cards uh, because the order is being challenged in very uh, substantive ways. And uh, it will also impact India. So that is one. Can I get to the second one or you want to ask a question or something? I have a couple of points that uh, you mentioned, of course, uh, in broad agreement with pretty much everything uh, on a you know, geopolitical global scale. But uh, one is you mentioned that the U.S. is fighting in four theaters. It's involved in four different theaters. And will it fight there or will it win in one? There is also an alternative view which says that uh, they don't intend to win. The American war machine is a profiteering capital uh, intensive one which intends to fight and keep generating this because they haven't won anything, not even Vietnam, right? Since a century after the uh, World War entry, after the World War entry, they haven't really won anything, but they have fought and they have made their military might uh, a very valuable proposition to the rest of the world. It's served as a platform to sell their uh, defense equipment. Another thing you mentioned is the uh, economy, you know, the world moving from economic security to a national security perspective. And I just wanted to say that it's been very 
very true and it's been borne out by so many nations including you know defense spending going up in japan and germany the eu focusing on you know the eu is a trading union and now that's veered completely towards security so that's that's something that uh, you know for the audience it's a very valuable point you should uh, research into it so um yeah about the american uh, you know um defense so you know you absolutely right the issues that you're raising today is at the center of uh, debates in america elbridge colby matt pottinger and a whole lot of these people who uh, will likely be in the trump administration if yeah. trump comes uh, yes. i mean i'm just presupposing uh, they are all for, you know, end to Ukraine. I mean, Trump has said we'll end Ukraine in 24 hours, whether he can do it or not. But the way he's probably going to do it is to call for a Korea-style armistice that frees wherever you are and let's, let's, let's get out. I mean, uh, there are many uncertainties there, but the point really uh, that uh, Trump's uh, advisors are making is that we do not have the bandwidth. Let us understand. Uh, and let's see how the American system works or has been working. See, it works in this very, in this manner. They get talent from all over the world. So our smarter brothers and sisters are in America. They are in their universities, the smartest minds, Satya Nadella, so on and so forth. They produce, this talent produces their wealth and their technology. From that wealth, the money that is generated, we invest in this 950 billion dollar 800 bases 11 aircraft military what does it do it gives america the freedom to roam the globe mm. and of course it is undergirded by the dollar system the dollar system which lets you lets your debate go to 35 trillion dollars so it's it's complex but military power does lie at the root of this whole enterprise it is not only a military enterprise it is a strategic military enterprise. of course the arguments that you make about military industrial complex are valid so the issue today in america is what they are saying why invest so much as you pointed out if you are an opera of failing deterrence you 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 scrambled out of afghanistan in ukraine you're not really winning West Asia, the Houthis are challenging you. The Houthis, the maritime traffic in uh, the Red Sea, first three months of 2024 has uh, reduced by half. Yeah. Houthis. Uh, Soleimani knew that he could never meet uh, the uh, Iran, will never have aircraft carriers. So he produced these land based carriers. Houthis, mm. Hamas, um, Hezbollah, the militias in Iraq and Syria. They've got this ring of fire against uh, 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 America's principal ally in, um, in, uh, in, in West Asia. So in that sense, American military power, which was never challenged, is now being challenged. Uh, so there I agree with you. And, uh, you know, this point about national security is stupid. What does it mean? It means uh, one time Bill Clinton said economy is stupid, which meant that at the end of the day, no matter what you say, it is economy. But it does uh, seem to me, for all the reasons that I pointed out, that it is becoming national security. As to, and this is of two reasons. One is because, uh, you know, American statecraft has atrophy. Kissinger said, never let the Russians and Chinese come together. Simple, wise stuff. The succeeding administrations have done precisely that. Russia and China are together. And these four countries that I spoke about in a couple of years, their nuclear arsenal will be double that of USA. Mm -hmm. Roosevelt, President Roosevelt pointed out to the Americans that if you wish to retain, secure your values, the democracy that you cherish so much, make sure you have an arsenal of democracy. It's a lovely speech. That arsenal of democracy is Kahal Kya hai. with some figures. Russia today is firing 4,000 missiles into Ukraine. Now, any military man will tell you that to intercept one missile, you need two. So, right. USA needs 8,000 interceptors, 80 interceptors a year. You know how many they can produce? 500. The Americans have now spiked up their artillery munitions. They will be able to spike it up once they put their whole military industrial complex, if it gets going, 1.5 million rounds by the end of 2025. Mm -hmm. What is Russia firing today? 5 million rounds per month today. So. America doesn't have seven days of missiles and precision munitions to fight in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Now, the point I'm making is that if India has got similar strategic uncertainties 
And come 2028, if we are pushed into a fight with China, we should not be in this predicament. I'm not making a case for war fighting. I'm saying deterrence. And if you don't have deterrence, I mean, deterrence is costly. It costs money, but wars are costly. You don't agree with me, ask the Ukrainians. Now, this is the unfortunate part. Geopolitics has swivel towards national security for whatever reasons. And we should be cognizant of it. But this other point that you raised you know, of the economic uh, tie-in with national security, uh, economic tie-in, the balance. See, this is a very important issue. And I just like to spend two minutes with it because it takes us to the heart of national security and our well See, the higher order objectives of statecraft are, of course, to have a secure environment so that the economy progresses, productivity rises, trades flows, and our people prosper. I spoke about the American model. Our own civilizational wisdom tells us, it speaks of the Mishran or the convergence of uh, Lakshmi or Saraswati, Lakshmi and Durga. Look at how brilliant it is. That you must have centers of excellence, academia, which give you this technology, this talent, use that to create wealth. Much of our, the next phase of our national security evolution has to be in the private sector and startups. Yes. So wealth, and use some of that wealth to nurse instruments of power. The problem with India has been that, you know, in the placement of our instrument of force in our strategic calculus, we have been ambiguous. We are not too sure of what we want to do with it. We are a little uneasy with it. And that will create problems when your strategic environment is not so high. So good statecraft will be the aggregate of economic well-being and strategic poise. There we have to be careful. When we say, you know, 1.9%, 1, 1.8%, 1. this is just an economist argument. You look at the economy and say, this is how much I can spend. Where is the insurance premium going to come from? In 1962, our GDP was almost the same as of China. Our per capita GDP was higher. We decided not to invest in defense. Was our economy not thrown back by three decades, two to three decades? Now, what you do with this? See, look at the American argument. Dr. Panchanathan, the box of the American Science Foundation, nothing to do with the military. Mm. American Science Foundation says we are the offensive arm of Pentagon. Without us, Pentagon is mere defense. Will this boss of the Indian scientific research, whatever in India, ever speak this? So, our statecraft, this military, you know, is somehow uh, <laughs> not. Uh, uh, we are not wise to the use of military power. I'm not making a case for jackpooting around the world, but a technologically enabled, precise military, which you can use in your own uh, self-interest. I'll just make two points. This integration that you talk of is not only um, uh, economy, it is also diplomacy. Mm. George said, and it's brilliant, negotiations are but an euphemism for capitulation unless the shadow of power is cast across the body until how brilliant that if you do not have military leverage if you don't have the backing of those aircraft carriers your voice will not be strong so it is a wise adroit mix of all these all the quivers in the arrows of your all the arrows in the quiver of your statecraft and it has to be a fine balance so that is really the argument i would conclude by saying national security is public good so in that sense, we need to, you know, Vasudev uh, Kutambakam is a lovely idea. And I keep saying this, uh, a lovely idea, one world, what is it, one earth, one family, one future. But Swami Vivekananda warned us, he said, the world is but a gymnasium where nations come to make themselves strong. The hard ball of the world, Swami Vivekananda. So we have to be conscious of both. And if both these uh, perspectives, you know, are embedded in our statecraft, uh, we'll be that much better. So that really is my view and uh, the argument that I wish to add. So uh, a couple of points that you mentioned is about uh, approaching the economy more like an econ economist instead of understanding that military power can also boost it and being very... Conjoined. Conjoined. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, of course, we function in silos. Now you've been involved... I'll, I'll give you one, one lovely phrase, you know, I read somewhere. It's, and this talk is about, see, unfortunately, in India, we've had these civil military silos. I don't know who was yes. it, silos. 
if we fuse those cycles in the spirit of Saraswati, Saraswati, Lakshmi, Durga, this is a lovely phrase. He says that you'll have a polity which is alive to the nuances of national security and wise to the uses of military power. The day economists start arguing for a hike in the defense budget, the day our MEA says that please hike the defense budget, instead of it coming from service officers, because when it comes from service officers, it seems narrow-minded, turf-oriented, or just say, carry a military industrial complex, you know, that, that's not really the spirit behind it. It is to ensure that our statecraft has a healthy mix of both. Um, it's a broader point since you yeah. mentioned uh, silos are uh, uh, a system where, you know, it, it's more of a corporate bureaucratic system yeah. and it's ingrained into India and it's the exact opposite of how our civilizational kingdoms used to function. For example, every uh, king had their Raj Dharma with their Raj Niti and, uh, you know, it, it included rules of war need for defense and very frankly the idea of nationalism today is is lost beyond a certain aesthetic show of it most people do not really realize the effects of war which we can see in our neighborhood so clearly right these were people going into work uh you know one day looking probably for makeup items and you know cooking uh, things and the next day they're dead so that is the reality of war and most people are unable to absorb it which creates which allows these silos to function and it's not uh, a very pressing issue for a lot of people in also that in our, our, our ambiguous approach to power see guru Tegh bahadur he says bal hoye bandhan chute and i'm quoting arun shore bal hoye bandhan chute sab kuch lage upaye Translated in English, it means when strength accrues, shackles snap, every move seems a stratagem. This is exactly what China is today. It has mm -hmm. become so powerful that the world keeps wondering, Achha, ye kyo kiya, wo kiya. so I'm arguing for that kind of power, smartly packaged, but benign power, not revisionist, not to sure. jackboot around the world. But power is important. It, 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 uh, it, you know, your place in the pecking order and all. So I'm a votary of power in that stream. Integrated power, defense, economy, diplomacy, technology, everything. We have to be powerful in that sense. Right. So uh, since you mentioned, you know, the necessity of lack of silos and how economy also ties into security, what is your thought on, uh, you know, economic threats? For example, I'm just uh, because this is very topical and trending. Uh, the constant attack of uh, these shock sellers from Hindenburg that attack india's sort of uh state arm uh capitalistic arm for uh you know development national development so uh this is something that keeps happening on one hand we have the hungarian uh, president being very certain that george soros is a threat to national security he's an economic terrorist and cannot be allowed to enter hungary which is his country of birth um and on the other hand, we just have uh, politicians and the entire parliament um, discussing a foreign origin report as if that is uh, gospel, so to speak. So one question is that about how uh, economy ties uh, in very closely to national security and what are the um, ways we can actually protect ourselves in these regards. The second is, you know, all of the points you've mentioned. Uh, the lack of reform, the lack of military spending, the lack of innovation in defense. Uh, you've been involved in the doctrine development process and there is no one better that I could ask this of. What are the reforms that you think have been implemented? Uh, what are the changes that you would like to see implemented? The, those two questions. Okay, so let me start with the second one because I'm more familiar with that. Then we'll come to the first one, the first that Hindenburg See, the, uh, um, you know, we've, uh, um, our military reforms have come in bits and starts. Mm -hmm. There have been periods where after 62, there was major reform and necessitated by what happened in 62. In 71, we did remarkably well under Prime Minister Gandhi and Sam Manikshaw, Sangat Singh and all. Uh, we created, uh, you know, Bangladesh and 
it was really restructuring the geography of South Asia. Militarily, it was success. Some say it is India's most remarkable victory in modern history. Uh, the London Times compared it with the Blitzkrieg and, and a whole lot of stuff. So in a military sense, that was good. Then we've had our reforms in bits and starts. Under Rajiv Gandhi, Sundarji, we had a technology drive, mechanization drive. But it was really very iffy in, in a larger sense. The And it, I would say that, you know, global change in defense was largely bypassing us. We would respond in bits and starts. Of late, we have begun to react to global change. But what we now need to do is to drive change in our national security futures if we have to stay on top of the game. So let me now just uh, add to uh, this, 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 the larger frame of this argument. So, uh, you know, this government, I mean, without wanting to be political, this government has initiated these reforms and why we must talk about them because I actually feel they are the most ambitious, bold, far-reaching reforms since independence. Because if you don't talk of that, you don't give uh, you know uh, uh, due credit, then you will not get to the second phase of reforms. So this is really very bold. What is bold in the Indian context? CDS DNA. You know, it took us 50 years of advocacy to get to the CDS. When I was a colonel, I made one of the first presentations around the CDS, and I was told, "Shut up! It's not going to happen." It happened. I took over the Baramula division from. Uh, Anil Chauhan. I never thought that there will be a CDS and Anil Chauhan would be the CDS. It happened. It's a real game changer in terms of our civil military relations. You know what the government has said? It's told the military, listen, we are empowering you. Now drive change through the national security system. And ask the CDS. He's got a very tough job, tough job um, lined up before it. But it is a game changer. DMA, Department of Military Affairs. We used to argue of for minimal representation in the Ministry of Defense, Armed Forces Officers. Yeah, the government has given you a department, secretary level powers, all the budgets, go ahead with your reforms, game changer. DRDO, you know, today DRDO needs to be restructured as a startup. It is this whole bureaucratic labyrinthine. It needs to be restructured. Reforms are happening. Now I know how difficult it is because you will not. DRDO, our PSUs are designed to get you legacy systems. They will not get you technologies which are coming from innovation. You know, startups like Helsing, Helsing, uh, this one, Palantir, two fifty startups in Ukraine have changed the character of war in such profound ways that Mark Milley says they are the most profound in recorded history. These are the changes that are happening. So we have begun DRDO, defense coming out of the shadows of foreign policy and a whole lot of other issues. So I'm saying most productive, boldest reforms since independence, Adhman Bharata in defense. Can you believe it? I never thought that an Indian startup would get an order from US Spacecom. It's happening. Samir Joshi, SpaceX doing some great work in drones. Mm -hmm. It's happening. Uh, Tata Airbus coming together to challenge the monopoly of HAL happening. You ask speak to anybody in the defense space, the PSUs were untouchables. So great reform is happening here. But given the complexity of the China or the enormity of the China challenge, we'll come to China in a bit. You know, it's military. They have a lot of problems, corruption, this, that. They have created the most sophisticated instrument of long range cutting edge precision their rocket force they have created a strategic support force a separate service like raising an indian army to drive artificial intelligence mm -hmm. so they are remarkably forward looking in all that there and the complexity in the changes of character of war see the threats before us western horizons what happens coming from the wtc the need to change turn to the seas the Chinese are going to be a 400 ship navy. They are going to patrol the world. So when it comes to these challenges, we need to do a lot more in terms of pace and scale. So a lot of changes still need to be done. Cultural transitions, this whole business of L1. We need to get a new model of procurement for innovation. The next phase of evolution will come from public, from private sector and startups. 
Today, 7 out of 20 majors in the world, corporate defense majors, are Chinese. So we also have to get into that business of national champions, national champions, companies that we pick up, we fund, and they give us products. Uh, the CDS made a, a speech last week. I'll put a lovely live phrase. He said, we now need to acquire autonomy, sovereignty over the product cycle. So everything has to be produced here. Chips. You know, chips. If you read uh, Chris Miller, the chip led to the Soviet defeat in Cold War I, substantially. Mm -hmm. Not uh, alone, substantially. It is shaping Cold War II. Look at the battle. 2020, China was in the 40 nanometer game. Last year, they have produced 7 nanometers. Now the battle is over 3 nanometers. And all this Chip Production Act and all. So it's a, the contest is intensifying. The future is AI. Do remind me, we must speak 5 minutes about AI. AI is going to change the world. Indian Army has to step up into AI. So I would say there was a time when change used to bypass us. We have started reacting to change. Now we need to drive change. If we have to become this wish for Bandhu and uh, Vikasit Bharat, you need a military component to secure that. That military component needs to get technologically enabled, agile in thinking. So, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, this is what you're saying. This other part that you talk of, the national security is not merely about the military or absolutely right it's about economy it's about the other stuff that is happening in that case you may well be right i'm not an economist so i don't know but i mean there's no doubt that our economy is doing well inflation is in control we are going pretty well we have problems but uh, we do seem to be the toast of the world in many ways so our adversaries will hit us but uh, the health of our economies is it not reflected in the stock market the stock market mm. continues to rise. So that shows that there is stability and these things will happen. Uh, we should, it should not bother us. But, uh, you know, unless you're going to come to it, we must talk of this informational piece and all uh, in, in, in statecraft. There I want to make a few points uh, which are very important and, and a little similar about the broader threats. Sure. Shall I go ahead? Yeah, yeah, yeah so, you know, you, uh, in your the quick question that you sent me, you spoke of information, the narrative. So, it, that is very important. You know, somebody said, unless the lions have their own historians, the yes. story of the hunt will always favor the hunted. So, you need a narrative. Uh, you need a narrative. Uh, everybody needs a narrative. But see, more than the narrative, see what's happening today in the world. TikTok. The Chinese are using it, it as an <laughs> algorithmic tool to manipulate Western audiences. And they're doing it very well. Uh, we should not be unaware of this. AI. By the end of this year, they say you will not be able to distinguish between a deep fake and what is real. Mm. Google, in the pre-AI phase or pre-chat GPT-4 phase, you had 3 million websites, 103 languages, but you made your choices. Today, chat GPT-4 gives you one very smart, articulate answer, but it is, could be a very manipulated answer. Mm. So, somebody said, you know, coding is just 30% of this whole AI game. 70% is the data, how you use it, how you shape it, how you interpret it. That will be used to manipulate you. So if if the world is going to be reborn, remade in AI, that's what people are saying. We have to be very wary of all these things. Online information. People say by next year, you will not be able to trust online information. 70% of Bloomberg's articles I'm told, told today are churned out by machines. I mean, oh, if true, it's, it's amazing. If true. So look what it's doing. But I, what I would really like to point out to you is the threat from China. And that is far more sophisticated. Because you know what? China is not only building an information piece. Uh, they are infusing it with stealth, deception and trickery. Mm -hmm. uh, their 100-year marathon is a combination of all that. An information narrative stealth, deception, trickery. Well, let's just spend two minutes to understand that and why it is so important. You know, the Chinese philosophies, their 36 stratagems say, to cross the oceans, deceive the heavens. So look at how deception is ingrained in them. And democracies are systems of transparency, 
the way we look at the world is a little innocent and we are falling prey to that. That needs to be, uh, you know, really understood. Western uh, philosophers like Clausewitz, they say, you know, trickery, muses, these are weapons of the weak. Sun Tzu says they are weapons of choice. Mm -hmm. So see how they look at it. Now, I'll quote this to you. Look how the Chinese have, have shaped their ascendancy based on this narrative, based on this outlook. There's a journalist, John Pilger, I wonder if I pronounce it right, P-I-L-G-R. He says in 1944, Mao wrote to Washington. He made a fresh first appeal to Washington. He said, China must industrialize. It can only do so by free enterprise. Free enterprise. China is talking. He says, Chinese and American interests fit together economically. America need not fear that China will not cooperate. Mm -hmm. But he receives no reply. A decade later, Chao and Lai and Mao again make this appeal. They say, you know, we are communists, but only for a while. The Communist Party will ultimately become like you. Just give us some time. We need to grow. What was this deception? To cross the ocean, deceive the heavens. Uh, Michael Pillsbury tells us, you know, this and see how they have built it up over a time. This phrase of Deng Xiaoping, bide your time, build your capabilities. I didn't buy it, very famous phrase. So it is based on ambiguity. When ambiguity is in your statecraft, see what they do. When Z talks of harmony, the Chinese translation is unipolar dominance. Yes. When he talks of the China dream, he's saying, we will become the unipolar power economically, militarily and culturally. When they talk of Middle Kingdom, they are saying, you know, the heavens above and the barbarians below us. So the rest of the world is barbarian. They need to be civilized. Now, that's their view of the world. So when he spoke of hide and bide, he meant that we will overturn the old hegemon and exact our revenge. Revenge for what? Not really USA, but Western humiliation, 100 years of humiliation. This is what that other chap was doing when changes and he says, but only once the rising power has developed the ability to do so. So they bided their time. Now Z is talking of loud and proud, South China Sea. Now they say this 100-year marathon is not a written strategy, but it mm. is ingrained in every mind of every soldier, bureaucrat, politician, in the Tsinghua University, in the Chinese party Politburo think tanks. It is put into your system. It is not a strategy put in some vault. In Western democracy, India may be key argument. Are, where is your strategy? As if you, you must write the strategy, but just the writing on the strategy will not produce wonders. It is this strategy and it has worked. I'll give you one example. Or just two to three examples will drive it. So it is information, stealth, deception, long-term stuff altogether. You know, in 1992, when China is nobody, the Navy doesn't even have one aircraft carrier. They find out that the Soviet Union has, there is a disused Soviet aircraft carrier lying in one of these shipyards in Ukraine. So they decide to pick it up. Now this, if they go for your open acquisition, it will stir the Western world. So they look at a covert operation to get an aircraft carrier. This is a true, true story. Huh? They pick up a very handsome looking footballer called Zhu Zengping. And this guy is made to masquerade as a businessman from Macau. And he goes to the Ukrainian and say, we, I want this aircraft carrier for a floating casino. Uh, I and remember. You remember? And he takes a lot of these this money, $30 billion, keeps these Ukrainians liquored up and bribery and all. And to cut a long story short, he gets this aircraft carrier. They can't find a tower. They hire a Dutch tower to tow it. The Turks don't allow them passage through the Bosporus state, Strait. Hu Jintao mm -hmm. intervenes. So look at deception, the businessman, Sam Dam Dand Bhed, mm -hmm. uh, Hu Jintao, statecraft, all coming in to get that aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. We will have a DPP, we will go in for procurement. I mean, that is our style. Uh, IPAC, you know, two years back, I was at this uh, Indo Pacific Army Chiefs Conference of uh, 2017. So there was a Chinese general sitting next to me, one seat away, and the Americans were lecturing the whole lot on freedom of navigation and all that. And he just kept quiet the whole day. In the evening, he comes to me and says, uh, 
you know, I'm from India, so we exchanged some pleasantries and said, General, what's your view? So I also gave the same view, 12 nautical miles, freedom of navigation. He says, you know, if the Americans, they have 40 bases around us. And if every day they send a ship out to test the principle of freedom of navigation, is it freedom of navigation or it is coercion? Yes. So I thought coercion, but I said uh, freedom of navigation. So he tells me, but don't worry, General, by 2035, the issue will not be whether American ships stay 12 nautical miles of Shanghai. The issue will be whether Chinese ships stay 12 nautical miles of California. So from humility to hubris, and they are going on that path. The Americans talk of small yard, high fence, all big technologies in a high fence. The Chinese play it very cleverly. They are saying small yard, big world. We'll give all the technologies to the global south. I'm saying for everything, they have a response. And it's not no guarantee that it will succeed, but it is just not military, military information, everything. Look at. Mao's appeal, what Deng does, what Z says, change is not seen in 3,000 years. And now they are beating the Americans at their own game in capitalism and innovation. White dance is beating Tesla. They may be an autocracy, but they are a meritocracy. They may be an autocracy, but they are auto innovation engines. They compete Shanghai versus Beijing. Who will produce the battery faster? Now, this is why they are doing well. Look at the manufacturing capacities. 2004, the manufacturing capacities value added were half of that of the Americans. Today, they are twice that of the Americans. It also means because of these manufacturing capacities, the Chinese military industrial complex is five to six times more efficient. Last figure I'll give you, trade. 1967, ASEAN gets established. When ASEAN is established, it is viewed as a pro-West organization. So China doesn't do business with it. And the Americans also, you know, Asia is too small. EU is the one to do business with. But 2000, there's a change of mind. China does an FTA with Asia. Mm. You know, smart FTA. In 2000, Chinese trade with Asia is $40 billion. American trade with Asia is $135 billion. Today, American trade with Asia is $450 billion. Chinese trade with ASEAN is $975 billion, the world's largest trade relationship. So more than the information piece, we must be worried about what they call military civil fusion. Mm. We began with this argument, putting all elements of statecraft, trade, manufacturing, technology, geopolitical concepts, I, this aircraft carrier. Look what Mao said. It's not happened in a jiffy and they've gone through many setbacks. But what amazes me that it could actually be a hundred year strategy mm -hmm. and it didn't work smoothly, but they kept at it. Now, when we talk of narratives, can we fashion these narratives? Very different, difficult in a democracy. And here now take a comprehensive look. Is what really lies behind Hindenburg? If what you're saying is true and it may, may well be, then understand the response. The nature of democracies are such that the other debates will overtake everything. And this sense about, you know, national security, what you're calling nationalism, of your, a sense of where your own self-interest lie and how you could be manipulated. We have to be uh, very careful. In fact, if you have time, we we'll speak on that manipulation piece also. Uh uh, I just want to make a couple of points to the audiences uh, because you've uh, mentioned a few things. Check out Build Your Dreams Bike, which is what uh, Sir said was competing with Tesla. I actually saw a car on Indian streets. Tesla has not yet been allowed. India is one of the largest markets in the world, right? Uh, so for China to make that entry into the Indian market and the US failing to do so, also speaks a little bit to uh, you know the caliber and their thinking. Another point that you mentioned is about Michael Pillsbury. He's one of the foremost China observers. That's what he's done throughout his life. So in, on anything related to China, that's one person that really should be read. He is a senior fellow for China strategy at the Heritage Foundation. Um, and. Uh, uh, I think that you, you keep mentioning the civil-military fusion. Uh, 
Big Talk also was mentioned, right? Uh, in fact, in one of my articles about, uh, you know, during the rising anti-Semitic protests across US universities, it was found that Big Talk a lot of the content. When people went and questioned these protesters, that what are you, uh, you know, protesting for? Do you know what uh, River to the Sea means? Do you know what the first principle of the Hamas Charter is? They had no idea. So they were getting radicalized and you can see the impact very quickly because there was this one letter to America from Osama bin Laden which was made viral over TikTok one day. And within the, within that week there was a rise in uh, you know protests again after they tended to die down a little bit. So there is this uh, civil point that you know really leads, leads to a lot of internal instability which really must be uh taken into account so this is the point five war that is you know uh, cited quite a few times so what are your thoughts about that can we call it influence operations or is it just technological interference cyber warfare what do we do you're absolutely right so you know influence operations are also if there's one country which is master it is china and i'm not quoting china because i admire it i'm quoting china because that is the challenge we have to study it to understand it and respond so, you know, you mentioned these books. I must recommend one book, Spies and Lies by Alex Joske, J-O-S-K-E. Uh, it is about Chinese influence operations. Do read it and I'll just come to it. Before that, I want to make one point about talent. See how important talent is. Uh, I spoke about that talent system and why we need to encourage it in India. Meritocracy, talent. Z got entry into the Chinese Communist Party in his 11th attempt. Ten times he was rejected. In China today, if you wish to secure entry into the Chinese Communist Party, which is really a ticket to prosperity, in our case, if it is the civil service or whatever, equalizing, you, if you are a girl, you have to be in the first two in such a large country. Only two get entry into the Chinese Communist Party. So they have to be feared because they are an autocracy. They, they are a meritocracy despite being an autocracy. Mm. This ecosystem of talent. You know, there's a lovely uh, Turkish proverb which says, you know, why talent is important at every level, every level. It says, when a clown moves into a palace, when a clown moves into a palace, he doesn't become king. The palace becomes a circus. So you need talent at every point. Because Sorry, this, this, is, this is, this is, this is brilliant. This is a Turkish proverb. I read it in the Times of India and I noted it down four or five know. months back or sometime back. So when a clown moves into a palace, he doesn't become king. He thinks he's becoming king, but he doesn't. The palace becomes a circus. So merit all the way. You know, Kiro Kishore Mehwani makes a very serious argument for Indians in our favor. He says, you know, in the most competitive human laboratory in the world, USA, Indians do better than the Chinese. Good. Ecosystem. In our case, that ecosystem has to change. Uh, he says if Indians in India, if their productivity can be even 25% of their counterparts, Indian counterparts in USA, India's GDP would be $25 trillion. Mm. So productive ecosystem. And that is the argument of civil military fusion. Break these silos. Fuse talents. Ultimately, it should not matter whether it is civil or military. Talent is talent. The guy driving AI in Pentagon is not a service officer. It is Craig Mato, mm. one of the best known AI minds. Similarly, if a military officer with talent should be in the MEA. MOD should have domain specialists, strategic affairs, technology. It just can't be all uniformed and bureaucracy. So we have to grow to those levels of maturity and hopefully one day we will. So that's the this business about information operations, you know, I'm quoting straight from this book. Influence operations is a new form of state, a spy craft that the Chinese have evolved. It is ruthlessness in the leveraging of soft power. So soft power is the facade and it is ruthlessly backed. And that therein lies the danger. And this book talks of the most successful influence operations in the world is what the Chinese have done over the last two decades. It is driven by the Ministry of State Security, MSS, 
And what does it do? Cyber espionage, steel sensitive technologies, trade secrets, proprietary research. And the front is all influencers. Influencers, so travel agencies, writing associations, publishing houses, alumni associations, charities, even a Buddhist temple. And who all have been manipulated? An Australian Prime Minister, US Congress, prominent think tanks, FBI. So they do these small, small things, offer meetings with their party leaders, say that we want to become like you. And they have shaped societies around the world. And in a mega sense, what they did was they lulled the world into this China's peaceful rise. It was never rising peacefully. It was biding its time. And what should really worry you is that it is this whole game peaceful rise was actually a determined attempt to dislodge the number one. And while the Americans were asleep at the wheels, today China is 70% of their economy. In 37 out of 44 uh, technologies, emerging technologies, China leads. So China is a far difficult nut. It, 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 uh, it made the Americans sleep at the wheels through this influence operations. And how did they do it? I'll give you two examples. So there's a gentleman called Lan Di. Lan Di, Chinese. In 2001, he was the toast of Washington. He was the secretary general of a cultural organization there, frequent invited to the National Press Club. He was a close friend of Chas Freeman, a prominent China mind. A small man with a disarming smile. He was studying the USA at the China campus of John Hopkins University. Self-effacing, when he would be called for talks, he would say, you see, I'm really not an American specialist, but you call me, I come. He would speak of Chinese reforms, open society, prosperous, modern, uh, and connected with the who's who of Washington and the United States, American business, politics, media, and academia. It turns out in 2004 that he was chief of the Social Investigation Bureau of MSS, Ministry of State Security. He was a spy. And he, had over, he was overseeing an extensive network of clandestine assets, deep influence, and the US elite was in deep influence, you know, making friends, opening doors. But none of that was done in that cloak and dagger sense of the old spy craft. Much more sophisticated. So you can charge him with anything. And in this book, he draws this comparison. He says, you know, there's grains of, grains of sand strategy. So hypothetically, I mean, it's just hypothetical anecdotal. If the Soviets or the Russians are told to get thousand grains of sand. They will send a submarine in the dead of the night and pick that sand and get it back. What will the Chinese do? They will send thousand tourists in broad daylight. Right, right. So the spy is in the background. Out of these thousand, hundred will be there to get you those grains. So it's not offensive. It's not in your face. Australian Senator Sam Dastiari got political donations, started singing the Chinese tune in, you know, with regard to their stance in South China Sea and so many other people like that, Australia, US, UK. They fooled the American Science Foundation. The American Science Foundation started transferring latest scientific know-how and technology to the Chinese. Peaceful rise. We will get you, make you part of the WTO. And today they are challenging them in science, chips and everything else in AI. Most of the technologies I said, they are ahead. Uh, the American Science Foundation opened an office in Beijing. They fooled George Soros. George Soros set up a China fund and he got a gentleman here talking of open society in China. The co-chair was a guy called Yu Eng Guang and he partnered with the Chinese International Cultural Exchange Center. They used Soros's funds his legitimacy and cover to do these Chinese influence operations. All done by the MSS. It is all documented in that book, footnoted properly. You know, and now look at this BRI, Global PLA, this 400 ship Navy is not going to patrol Chinese coastlines. There's a military component, trade component, dual circulation economy. That we will have one part of the economy which is absolutely self sufficient another part of the economy which is connected to the world. Now, all of it will not work. But the fact is that in terms of persuasion, advocacy, legitimacy, coercion, it is remarkable. You know, there's a Urdu couplet, which is, 
विच शुड समिट अप कि वो झूठ भी बोल रहा था इतने सलीके से ही वॉज सिंगिंग लाइज विद सच फिनेस वो झूठ भी बोल रहा था इतने सलीके से मैं बार ना करता तो क्या करता आई वॉज फोर्स टू बिलीव this sums this up and i can may not have been able to put it well your viewers must read the book mm-hmm. so uh, no, sorry no no yeah. to, to, i was okay. wanting to say so this uh, point 5 thing mm-hmm. look how they have done it mm-hmm. so information everything has oh. been yeah in that book lies and spies you must read it sure recent arrests was of a uh, of uh, Sumi Terry who used to be a CIA analyst and is married to the Washington Post foreign policy editor Max Boot she was arrested i think 3 weeks ago okay is it so uh, that's also a high position i have a lot of questions <laughs> like i i have uh, uh there's some quite a few questions down um especially you know since we're discussing influence operations and then we had to come to bangladesh as well which seems more along the color revolution lines than anything has seemed in decades so i i mean, could just make one point sagar has come to my mind see in response indian state craft what is samdham than the way it tells us to be wise to the ways of the world when it comes to national interest samdham than the way national interest by means fair or foul that to awakening we are too believing trusting what i call strategic innocence oh ye duniya us kaise bata i don't know how to put it across so we have to understand this that in the world of state craft international relations there are these many games being played we have to get beneath what is on the surface uh It's, it's it's not easy i mean international relations is not a morality piece uh, we have to understand that and therefore all instruments of power matter so first the understanding and even about academic universities i think our our curriculum is very theoretical absolutely it doesn't absolutely. give you a sense of what's happening in the real world no uh, what i was saying is ye kab badlega kaise badlega so uh, one of the things that aap aap badlenge aap ye jo podcast kar rahi hai inse badlega sir honestly uh, i don't why think i doing that these things because uh, i find in india uh, while the geopolitics piece is still discussed the national security piece is not discussed at all you go to us the people who are speaking on deep national security issues are civilians and they resonate with the military so that needs to happen national security is a is a very complex piece you know i'm quoting kissinger he said we have no strategic view we don't have a larger philosophical view so technologists are running right okay, so technologists are running right so we need people in humanities international affairs economy national security this is a very strong piece right you've mentioned mindset a lot on the sort of intellectual ecosystem that drives the chinese ways ye unka matlab the hen mein hai ki they will function towards national security regardless of the sector that they function in that is just the basic understanding that if our country is not strong nothing that we do will eventually matter so uh we have done of uh you know uh treatises and uh civilizational documents scriptural evidence to draw from the most well known of which is shastra and we don't draw from it there's one thing i think it was published in the orf by gokul sahani who's a friend and dr kajri kamal about india's changes in the navy na- naval change the maritime security and it drew from arthi shastra and how we were following that doctrinal approach uh, in certain ways perhaps Uh, unconsciously as well but it drew from that but we don't have a lot of these kinds of uh, papers that come out which you know people can draw from you know very recently in kamani i saw this play hamare ram by ashutosh rana hamare ram do watch it and as i was watching it i was telling my wife see how when i was growing up our schools were all english i mean that was the reality if you would had to do well you had to master sure. you were taught this stuff So Ramayana Mahabharat came to us from stories from our parents and all. They were very simplistic stories. 
Mm. I mean, my mother is to blame that I haven't understood the Ramayan way. But you speak to, you see, Ashutosh Rana, that whole Ramayan is a very elevated tale. Mm. It is a, a, a tale of statecraft, of politics. In those three hours, I realized that Ramayan is not just some stories put together here and there. Look at the Mahabharata. It talks of regime change, it talks of deeper politics, the morality in politics. I, my favorite quote is uh, Kautilya. I mean, we keep talking of Kissinger, Morgan Theo, this, that. Look how what beautifully he has put it. He said, Agar ko bhoologe, to apni sanskriti khologe. As simple as that. You lose your culture, your edifice. But agar shast ka karoge, to hi khologe. If you don't respect the instrument of force and place it sensibly in your strategic calculus, you will have no nation left, 62. What text tell us? But uh, we have not, and I'm, this is not just, you know, Hindi. Tirulavu I'm told, Guru Tegh Bahadur I quoted. There are so many others. How can it be that India is such a rich civilization was uh, not uh, cognizant of these things? So we have to resuscitate all this, get all these thinking uh, back. And perhaps your generation will do it because you're not burdened with, with Macaulay. My generation was. No, I, I don't know how I come across, but we're from the Macaulay generation as well. In I'm fact, Macaulay may be a good man, but we were overburdened by him. Especially due to the internet. And uh, you mentioned that national security, while geopolitics is part of discussions, national security is not. Because national security is idealistic. There are only a couple of ideologies that are deeply adhered to. And uh, an Indian ideology so far does not exist in the people and places that occupy the internet. And regardless of uh, how we, you know, put it, it is always the elites that, you know, take power eventually. It is. It is quite fascinating that a uh, Chaiwala did become president, uh, prime minister. It's. It's very rare, though. It's very rare. It does not happen. So the elites take power and the elites are from Macaulay, Macaulay's generation and geopolitics is easier to address because it can come from supremacism, it can come from anything superficial. National security though comes from an absolute understanding of, you know, a, an identity that is national, that is civilizational, as well as the need for its protection. Bowling, I mean, it's, it's not a matter of discussion in uh, Indian fora. On Indian fora very often. Yeah, but you are saying, Shiv Shankar Menon, I have heard him say this. Mr. Jay Shankar, I have heard him say this. He says, the elite ka understanding of foreign policy and strategic affairs is uh, is wavy. Jo sadak hai, the street, it understands national security, foreign policy far better. It is instinctive. So I am saying national security is common sense. We. I we take it to these elevated levels quite unnecessarily. It, 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 it is common. But though it is common sense, it is an area of, of depth. You need to have these, get all these understandings together. So it is also an area of great wisdom. I'll tell you what, see, I grew up in the military. We were told, you know, we are not uh, expeditionary. What was the Ashwamedhya? When you sent that horse around, you said, listen, this is, these are my circles of power. You agree or you don't agree. So it's not power projection, as I said, to jackboot around the world. If you don't meet threats at a certain distance away, they'll come to your doorstep. Absolutely. The under command was set up to project power across Malacca. If you don't project power across Malacca, the Chinese will come into the IOR. So it's my concept of theory here. It is common sense. Uh, but uh, somehow uh, we we weave uh, those uh, stories. Uh, we, street uh, streets know this instinctively. However, the people making the decisions, like the bureaucrats, like the silos we discussed, depend on those paper briefings where you know we have to, and which is fair. Like of course, it, this are details. We're going to it depends so you, on. You, you quoted the prime minister. Do read his speech to the combined commanders in 2015. It's on the net. It's on the PMO website. Your viewers must read. It's national security strategy. So commonsensical, it resonates with the military mind. Mm -hmm. So 
but yes, we need to get very commonsensical about it and, and in, in, in invest in it. Now, from a doctrinal perspective, from from the structures that the military, the defense, the industry follows, that is not true. So my thing is that Joey decisions, Manata and national security, they're not from this. They come from army schools or from, you know, other, uh, it's just a thing, army schools, but, uh, you know, they, they come from a bureaucracy, which is, uh, which does not, it's not commonsensical. It's very convoluted. It is very, very McCaulish. It, uh, You've seen the UPSC prep, uh, you know, how it goes about. They have to read the Hindu, uh, which, you know, has been uh, a certain way since decades. And uh, there's a certain thought process that does not take Indianness into account and our history and how we've been. So we will go with whatever's trending. For example, democracy as a trend. We, we embrace it. Uh, instead of thinking that analytically this is the best form of government, because it suits us, we've been decentralized and democratic for ages. We do it because the rest of the world is doing it. Yeah. And that does not keep national security in play. The same way it goes for every other philosophical trend that occurs. So that's something that, you know, it, it affects. So like, like you said, we have reacted. We've not driven change. That reaction is also because we are reacting. It's not very preemptive in nature. You mentioned Ashwamed. This is one of the questions that I had, especially considering Bangladesh, which is a subject that I really uh, do want to have you discuss on this channel. Uh, so uh, we've obviously been interventionist in our neighborhood previously. We have uh, given Bangladesh its independence and now it seems that it's gone. They, they want to be Pakistan, the people who've overthrown the Hasina government have very clearly showcased that, you know, they are on the, they, they use ISI uh, people, they use uh, such messaging, they've used, uh, we can, you know, talk about State Department interference, Chinese influence, all of that. But essentially, India has, is now on the back foot and it has another hostile front open here. Uh, what do you think about? uh interventionist policies whether through influence or uh through military operations and why uh should india not engage not from a revanchist sense but from a you know plain security perspective you know i i i, I do understand what you're saying our neighborhood is a cause for money and we have to be honest about it that things are not really right in in, in our neighborhood then in the past, when we have intervened militarily, Sri Lanka and Maldives, it was at the invitation of the government. Of the yes. Staff. In this case, is different. So what have we done? We have, I think, uh, been uh, pretty wise. We have said, uh, Sheikh Hasina, you are our friend. We we'll stand by you. But we also have to deal with the government of the day. So in that sense, it is it is pragmatic. Uh, so we are standing by Sheikh Hasina. We give extended all courtesies to her. And uh, we are saying that you, you, you please stay here as long as you can. Uh, the other part that you are talking about, you know, about, uh, I mean, there are competing forces. The Chinese are invested greatly into the Bangladesh military. Uh, the Americans are looking for St. Martins and all that. So those are a reality. And uh, till what happened on uh, when did this happen, Sheikh Hasina? 5th of August. Uh, we were playing our cards pretty well in Bangladesh. Something did go wrong. And uh, I mean, those are also, I think, internal factors of a, a democracy deficit. Th those things have also to be seen. Uh, largely, I would say that, you know, we must have, uh, we must not put all our foreign policy eggs in one basket. That should be the guiding metaphor, how you can actually do it in practice is a diplomatic challenge. But uh, the point that I'm making for, uh, you know, military power is not intervening in that sense. We should have capacities. And if at all, we have to intervene. In some cases, it could be at the request of the host government, not otherwise. It will lead to a, a lot of other problems. And in the long run, it will be comfortable. I don't disagree. I mean, I'm of the same opinion. I 
Pirots and I'll go through that list shortly about uh, the way that uh, it is not India's way to go and intervene. We deal with the diplomacy deals with governments that are legitimate, that are there, regardless of how they arrive to power. So, uh, but for the audience, uh, it, you know, it's very easy to be armchair specialists and say that humko ye karna chahiye, hum ja ke kyun nahi kiye. But uh, interventionism has its own. Is not national security. Yes, yes. Uh, no, I, I'm really grateful we've spent some time, but I can't let you go yet because one, you mentioned that we would take five minutes on AI. Uh, two, I have some audience questions that uh, you know centered around Agnivir, so if that. Uh, I'll ask you the specific questions, but if you could, uh, you know, discuss AI first and then go on to the See, AI, let me just tell you, in my view, how game-changing it's going to be. So look at the intellectual horsepower of AI. I'm told the smartest uh, human being was Albert Einstein. His IQ was 160. Mm -hmm. Chat GPT-4 was 155. Wow. Chat GPT six, which is going to be three to four years down the line, one five five zero. Most AI specialists are of the view that AI will be a billion times smarter than humans by twenty thirty five. So it is going to remake the world. The world is going to be fundamentally reborn. So there are two things. Three. It is going to create a new set of strategic haves and have nots. We must sense this. Outside, this is being debated so much in India. It is not. So AI, we have to see what we are going to do with our AI. And look at the Chinese now. Look at how smart. They say, in the civil space, we will regulate AI. Their regulations in the civil space is more stringent than EU and USA. But in the strategic military space, because it is national security interest, free wheeling. Therein lies the danger if you don't understand AI in its depth, domain understanding. Coding, as I said, is important. Data, compute, algorithms. We have to work on that. China has 238 large language models. We have none. AI in the military sphere is going to lead to better decision making, faster decision making. Hypersonics coming at Eight max cannot be intercepted manually, human judgment. It has to be at the rate of AI machine learning. So I can go on about AI uh, since I am pretty fascinated by the subject, but I'll just keep it brief. So what we really need to do is this part and the other part, the philosophy of AI, ethics, governance, how we are going to use data. You know, people say that all this data has been taken into our large language models and they are shaping what we need to do, say in economics, in uh, say in the stock market, all the products which are coming out. But this is based on very crude data which was available in the internet. The richer data is yet to come because it is in print, it is archived somewhere. That is the more valuable data. Companies are spending billions of dollars on that. Mm -hmm. And that data, if it is superior, will give you far better products in AI. So look at the whole game in data. We must really step up the debates in AI. What are we doing? Uh, we've had the GP and all, we've had some follow up, but not as much as we need. So, this AI is going to affect all walks of life health, education, financial services, national security, this, that, and the other. If the world is going to be fundamentally reborn, remade, what is the Indian opportunity? Can we do it in, should it be, should it be with, Indian sensibilities, Indian civilizational sensibilities. If today you do chat GPT, who are the, shall we say, realists in international relations? You will get Kissinger, Morgan, because it is from that data. Why not Kautilya? Why not somebody from the Mahabharat? Why not? So this shaping needs to be done. The world is being reshaped. This is our opportunity to get rid of that Macaulay's burden. And in Indian sensibilities, Indian thought and it is not a technology piece it is just 30 percent technology but as the singer says if you don't create this larger ai philosophy the technologists will run riots they will make it all about coding and all that mm -hmm. so you know this is what we need to do. ai must be taught 
in our universities. It is a humanities field, shaping AI, the systems that we need. So AI, I wanted to if you ever get me back on your program, we must do a full program on AI. On AI. Absolutely. On AI. I'd be very happy to host you again. I'm sure the audience will also learn a lot from it. Uh, um, I do, I, I think that's a very, very important subject, especially considering that India has the capacity that right? we've, we've done technologically, something that the rest of the world does not have, the UPI banking that we do is something that the rest of the world does not have, we finally gotten universal identification through Aadhaar, but we are so far behind when it comes to matters of strategic importance, such as using AI for it. Now, Look at the uh, economic opportunity in AI. That is another book of yours must be Coming Wave by Mustafa Suleiman. The most brilliant book on AI. Coming Wave, Mustafa Suleiman. And if you want to watch stuff on video, watch a guy called Mo Gwadat, Muhammad Gwadat. His ability to simplify AI is remarkable. It, it gives you a very good... And uh, Mustafa Suleiman says, the economic opportunity in AI is $15 trillion by 2030. A hundred trillion dollars by 2060, which is the size of the global economy today. McKinsey tells us that eight trillion dollars will be added to the economy because of AI every year, two to three years down the line. So we will also miss the economic bus if we don't step up the game in, in AI. Um, all right. Uh, uh, before I don't want to jump into another question there because this this is a conversation that should be for long. Uh, let me ask the audience question from Milin G has sent several questions. I'm just going to ask you, uh, try to uh, combine it and ask you one question about Agnivir. Uh, what are the changes that you would like to see? Any tweaks to the program as it is currently there? Uh, and how does the army contend with the hemorrhage of, you know, institutional memory, experience, combat skills due to, uh, you know, experience uh, going away and being replaced with Agnibir and the extent of decline that you foresee due to Agnibir. So, you know, here I'll disappoint your viewers because I am an advocate of Agnibir. No, no, I this will... is... No, no. Uh, no, no, I'm, just, I'm just joking, but I, I, let me say why AI is such a... Uh, why Agnibir is such a... All that I have, we have spoken before Agnivir should also tell us that Agnivir is not the only thing in national security that is happening. These last three months have been as if Agnivir is going to make India or destroy India. There is so much else which needs to be done. So AI has to be seen as one part of the larger change. Now, please understand, I spoke of that change. If this change, we must tweak it. We must do it right. But all change is going to be opposed. So now theater commands will come. We will oppose them. DRDO reform, somebody will oppose them. You take it from me, it will be stronger than op opposition. PSU reform, somebody will oppose it. A lot of people think startups have no business to be in defense. PSU is not going to be in defense. What will happen to you? DRDO is not going to be in defense. So I am saying everybody needs to reform. Armed forces need to reform. DRDO needs to reform. Everybody says, I will not do it. He will preach reform to the other. Is that fair? So in that sense, Agni Veer is what? Now the larger question that you ask, look at our short service officer scheme. It was a wonderful scheme. I am from the National Defense Academy, a very proud NDA. But in my regiment, there were people from short service. Some of them did better than me in many areas. So just by the training module that you come through doesn't guarantee what you're going to do later. What happened went wrong with the short service scheme? Initially, some of the finest bureaucrats were products of the short service. So you came to the military, if you didn't want to stay, you came to the civil services. They rose to the highest ranks and there were some, you know, relaxations in papers here and there. So there was encouragement for this flow. Then we stopped it. Why did we stop it? Silos. Civil service may koi wahan se nahi Military ne ka aap bhi nahi aai. MOD is all army. Do we want silos or we want pollination? Agni Veer is a scheme of cross-pollination. If it works in the long run, if it works in the long run, people will come. Those who wish to stay and do well here will do well. Those who wish to leave will leave and do well. And where will these people go? These people will go to CRPF. All DGs have come on televisions to say we will take them now. 
have they ever come since independence they never they said no they will not come they have come kalyani has told you they will come uh, adani has told you they will come all state governments have told you this is one time to please break the silos please acha now what are your problems with this scheme so there are three sets to the scheme one is the intake one is what you do with in service training and one is the exit model in the intake model the army at least found that we, many of our induction schemes were dated so you took a trained driver and trained him for 3 years what sense does it make if you can drive a car will you like to be trained to drive for 3 more years right these were the colonial legacies so we said bhai 3 saal ka aap 6 hafte gaadi chalana sikhiye चार हफ्ते कुछ आपको टेक्नोलॉजी सिखाएंगे और ट्रेनिंग कंप्रेस कर रहे हैं और जो पैसा बच रहा है ट्रेनिंग टाइम में उसको आप टेक्नोलॉजी में लगा रहे हैं आई हैव बीन टू माय यूनिट जस्ट टू टू थ्री मंथ्स बैक एवरीबॉडी इज डिलाइटेड दे आर हैप्पी विद द अग्नि वीड्स द चीफ मिनिस्टर डजंट गेट टू सिलेक्ट हिज डिस्ट्रिक्ट मजिस्ट्रेट्स हियर द सीईओ गेट्स 100 पीपल एंड इज चूजिंग द बेस्ट 50 फेयर एंड द अदर 50 गो मेनी ऑफ देम विल बी अब्सॉर्ब बाय ऑल दीस पीपल now if all this happens and it is a good cross pollination model you are getting disciplined people into the government some kind of discipline if your studio grows and tomorrow you are running what shall we say a 50 billion dollar studio and you get to know that five agni veers have been arri- have arrived in your town will you not pick up two wo aapka camera dekh lenge ye dekh lenge but the kid again it is common sense now all the things the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, some of the you know what shall i say the, the shortcomings that have been articulated they are being addressed now you have a chief of defense staff with 50 45 years of service three service chiefs we can't trust them to do even this tweaking six months one year are they going to destroy their own units if it is not going to be operationally efficient will they destroy it in my time people trusted me i trust them yes any arguments that you have any fresh please but this bit sabotage it. square one 60 years we have got a system then everybody has the same argument then dr also should not reform then let's start merrily going back to so this is the whole thing and the specific measures operational efficiency training times it will be tweaking for the technical arms that is all in built to it that will be done this business of you know all anybody who lays down his life should get uniform benefits this will be addressed why do not we trust our government why do we not trust the chief of defense staff they are all reasonable wise people they will do all this the choti moti tweaking if that is the only worry it will be done or jo baki wo hai wo this uh, you know change is a very difficult thing yeah and status quoism is a disease it is in our uh, in our blood and indian government and why i say there are a lot of good people in government and i know there are a lot of good people in the military they also want change but you asha if you don't want change it is a legitimate thing i mean i have got nothing against it so in a democracy voice it like i say what i say sometimes i get drowned out the others will say what they and the best argument will win in democracy change is about advocacy but at least be open to the idea of change and i have not picked one solid argument against whenever i have gone on debates around except to say ye ho jayega wo ho jayega they are they are people they are conscious of it they are taking care of it. that is my broad response to agni veer and you know the short service bit has to work in officers look at technical entry the army won't find day what it did it took off took your cut off marks in these it exams and all put you through an ssb give you a technical degree and those officers are now doing better than nda it's a future chief army commander may not be from nda unless nda doesn't reform so i have a got a video you see it i am a very proud nda i have been talking of nda reform harvard needs to reform nda needs to reform hindu college needs to reform everybody needs to reform this argument that see because i came from nda i am the best so i will not reform i will not let anybody come what is this argument compete with everybody and so in an army if there is a technical entry scheme there is a in the entry scheme there is another scheme short service it, uh, let the best man win why are we scared of competition mm-hmm. here also so aayenge usme se 50 rakhe jayenge yes the bottom line should be operational efficiency that should not be compromised after all the agnivir scheme is not being structured so that we lose the war 
सो एज लॉन्ग एज ऑपरेशनल एफिशियंसी अच्छा वॉट हैपन्स एल्स वेयर हम बार बार कोट करते रहते हैं यू एस ए इसराइल वहाँ क्या हो रहा है पीपल कम समी गोज आउट द मेरीन से वो जाता है टू अ यूनिवर्सिटी देन ही बिकम्स अ सेनेटर समी गोज टू द प्राइवेट सेक्टर देर होल मिलिट्री इंडस्ट्रियल कॉम्प्लेक्स इज फुल ऑफ दिस एवरीबडी इज एक्स कर्नल इसराइल Uh, their unit 8200 9300 8200 8200 is behind all these fantastic assassinations they are all military minds who have gone out and come come the other way around so i am saying talent from any source kya farak padta hai civil military in the larger sense everybody get talent merit talent and not ki bhai 10 saal se ye ho raha hai to badli nahi hoga अब कोई कहता है भाई वो अग्निवीर की पांच साल बाद निकलेगा तो उसकी शादी कैसे होगी आई एम नॉट डिमीनिंग दिस बट दिस कान बी दी आर्ग्यूमेंट्स फॉर अ मेरिटोक्रेटिक ऑर्गेनाइजेशन यू नो सो सो दैट इज माय 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 व्यू ऑन अग्निवीर वेल थैंक यू सो मच इट्स बीन अ प्लेजर आई रियली लुक फॉरवर्ड थैंक यू थैंक्स अ लॉट सुपर हां थैंक यू फॉर गेटिंग मी ऑल द बेस्ट टू यू थैंक यू